Hello fellow freelancers. So today I wanted to talk to you about being bilingual and being a translator. Are they the same thing? Are they different things? If they're different, what's the difference? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm bringing this up because this was a question that I got on, uh, actually it was on one of the YouTube videos, I think, about uh, you know if a bilingual person is a translator and what the differences are, et cetera, et cetera. And it just got me thinking, and so then I was working on a translation, and just while doing the translation itself, a couple things came up which I, which I jotted down, so I'm going to share them with you. Unfortunately, my experience, as I mentioned before, I'm an Italian to English translator, so anything that I notice or that I pick up on will be from Italian to English. So the stuff I'm going to go through are Italian, original texts in Italian translated to English, and I'm going to show you why being bilingual isn't enough just to be a translator. By the way, before we get into it, and before I show my specific examples, just briefly, a couple of um, reasons, broadly speaking, why being bilingual doesn't make you a translator is that there are two different things. Um, first of all, being bilingual usually means that you can converse, you can communicate in two languages comfortably. It does not necessarily mean you're native in both languages. In fact, no one's native in two languages Pretty much by definition, native tongue is one, it's the language you're most comfortable with, even if you speak two languages fluently. And uh, that's why translators, by the way, that's why you always translate into your native tongue, because in your native tongue, you know what's taboo, what isn't. Um, you know how things are supposed to sound, how they're supposed to flow, and you can understand more of the context of the people reading it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is a big reason also why being bilingual does not make you a translator, because you don't inherently understand these things. You understand these things through learning about them. And uh, by the way, another thing is that when you're a translator, a big part of what you do is writing. I mean, you know, that's pretty much all you're doing. You're just writing there. But um, this actually means, and people don't think about this often, it means that you need to be a writer as well. You need to be a good writer. because And being a translator means being able to grasp whatever is being said this includes the tone and the audience of whoever is watching it, the target market, all that stuff, and being able to transpose that into whatever language you're translating it into. And, you know, into the same tone or context, the target market, or to change it um, through either localization or something along those lines, depending on if it changes. Maybe a target market in one language is different from what the target market would be in another language or another country, and you need to change it accordingly. And so this can be, you know, very difficult. It, it, it really depends how difficult and how much it can change depending on the context. Things like advertisements and marketing, yeah, that can be very different. In certain countries, marketing is very loud in your face, da, da, da. In other places, more imagistic, like with images and more metaphorical. In other places, more straightforward. And I mean, it, it changes all over the place and you need to be able to adapt to do those things. But also, you know, I don't do the, these types of translations. I do mostly financial and legal, which tend to be very straightforward. But even with what I do, there are a lot of issues that need to be taken into account that translators know and learn about, but bilingual people don't necessarily know. Okay, so let's take one first example. Uh, in Italian, the, the original sentence in Italian uh, said, Una copia del rapporto di omologazione viene inviato a fornitore. Um, and so how do you translate this? A copy of the rapporto di omologazione would be the approval report. A copy of the approval report viene inviato a fornitore is sent to the supplier. So a copy of the approval report is sent to the supplier. That's how it's translated and it's 100% it's correct. Um, if you want to debate on whether you should use you know, this term or that term, we can get into it. But anyway, that's 100% correct. However, it's not, at least in, not in terms of the translation. And the main, and the issue is the verb tense. In Italian, you say, una copia del rapporto di omologazione viene inviato al fornitore. This is present tense, viene inviato, is sent. Um, but in English, for these types of contracts, these types of documents, you always use the future tense. Uh, you usually almost always use the future tense. Pretty much the only times you don't see it is when things have been translated from another language and, you know, wrongly so. Anyway, and so in, in English, it shouldn't be a copy of the approval report is sent to the supplier. It's a copy of the re approval report shall be sent to the supplier. That's how it is. And, um, and, I mean, just to give some more context, here's a bit of a longer sentence. 
Al termine di tale processo di verifica viene emesso un rapporto di omologazione che autorizza se positivo il pagamento dei campioni acquistati e delle attrezzature ordinate da the name of the company. How do you translate it this into English? So, at the end of the verification process, if successful, an approval report is issued to, the authorize, to authorize the payment of the purchase sample and of the equipment ordered by the name of the company. That's how a bilingual person might translate it, and correctly so, except that's not how it's used in the contract. It shall be, shall be issued, the future tense. At the end of this verification process, if successful, an approval report shall be issued to authorize the payment of the purchase samples and of the equipment ordered by XXX. So this is something that you learn from being a translator, that you know because you translate from one language to the other. It's not something that you ever think about. If you know both languages fluently, you might read this in Italian, you'll read this in English, they both make sense, and you don't even think about the change in verb tense because they, just, they both sound so natural in, e in each language, so it just doesn't compute. So you might translate it into the present tense and, and not even notice anything until you know, someone corrects you or someone you know, tells you how come all these are in the present tense and this isn't. Um, and this isn't, you know, the, all these are in the future and this isn't. And uh, so, yeah, you know, look, chances are, in terms of whatever contract you write, it won't change much. Most contracts they have say, you know, this contract is valid from so-and-so date or from the date of signing something, and then that's when things go into effect. But let's face it, that's the way things are written in the contract, and it can ch change something, especially if part of it is in present tense and part of it is in the future tense. So, you know, it's something to keep in mind. Um, anyway, then uh, what else do I have? Uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> another thing I had, well, So another term that I had translated there was um, prodotto fornito. Now, prodotto is product. Fornire is to supply. So a supplied product, a product being supplied is the way to translate it. Except this isn't always the case. Sometimes it's the product being supplied, the supplied product. Sometimes it's the product being provided, the provided product. You use two different terms in English. It depends. Usually the difference is, you know, you supply like to a wholesale thing, like a bit When you're speaking big volumes, it's you use supply, while when it's smaller volumes, it's provide. Um, but it really depends on the context. But these two words can be used to translate fornire. Fornire is, you know, is uh, supply or to provide. And um, so you need to know which one to use depending on the context. And unfortunately, if you just think, oh, supply, I know it's fornire, so I just use, you know, supply. Um, It won't really work in English, and uh, so just another thing to keep in mind. Once again, this this was just one contract. The things that I encountered in this one contract uh, that I thought would be interesting to show. And just briefly, one other example that I that I came about, and this was because um, I have a there's a friend of mine who's American, English is his native tongue, American American, but now he lives in Lugano, in the Italian part of Switzerland. And he has a local wife. He speaks Italian fluently, in fact, like a native, and you know he's. He speaks Italian all the time. So anyway, he contacted me because they needed, uh, his company needed something translated. And he's like, we need to translate these statutes for my company. And I was like, okay, uh, that sounds a bit off, but sure, let me know. So, so he sends me the stuff to be translated and it says, statuto di whatever, whatever. So, and you know, I wrote back out and I said something like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and I'd be happy to translate your bylaws. And, um, but he kept calling them statutes. And anyway, I found that interesting because statutes, Statuto of a company is not a statute. You have the word statute in English, and you have the word statuto in Italian, but when you use statuto in Italian, especially for the statuto of a company, it gets translated as either bylaws or articles of incorporation. Once again, depending on the situation. One is more like internal, one is more for legal purposes, external anyway. And in fact, this from country to country, they might be interchangeable or not. But they're never translated as company statutes. Once again, you only see this in badly translated documents. But So um, it, it has to be bylaws or articles of incorporation. Anyway, I thought it was interesting that a native American, a native English speaker, still was more used to the Italian way of saying it than the English way of saying it. But anyway, um, and so these are just, you know, so it's very intricate things that you don't think about because words might exist in both languages, but if you don't know if, you know, if this isn't, first of all, your native tongue that you're translating into and your specialty that you know well, then it's very easy to mess these up. And so you do need to know what you're doing. And that's the thing. Um, when you are bilingual, you use both languages for fun to communicate here, this here and the other, but it is a professional, you know, it's a profession. You need to be a professional when you do it. So you need to know what you're doing. 
and that's why being a translator is more than just being bilingual. Um, and, uh, but it was interesting because the guy who made the comment, he said, everyone says being bilingual doesn't mean being a translator, but I want to prove them wrong and just translate, you know, some stuff that I can use. And I was like, you know, do that. That's the best attitude you can have. I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to do it because at that moment, if you can do it and you can translate things and do it correctly, you've graduated from being bilingual to being a translator. And that's awesome. So, but yeah, you know, it's not extremely simple or straightforward. And definitely if someone is bilingual, a lot of people, what they'll do is, you know, you have a big company and rather than hire a translator, they want to just use someone who's bilingual in the company to translate stuff. And that's usually when you see these types of mistakes because, you know, they don't know and they don't, uh, they don't think about those things. And so that, you know, that's why those mistakes can pop up. So it's just something to keep in mind. If you know any other reasons uh, why bilingual people don't make trans, uh, translated like if they're not the same thing let me know maybe for your language combination you've seen something like this or for in your specific cases I'd be you know I'd uh, be interested to hear about them um, but these are just some that came to mind once again just with this last translation that I was doing I might have others in the future that I want to share but uh, yeah so be careful you know bilingual does not mean translator and um, so you really need to make sure that you know what you're doing and um, that you know the pitfalls and the mistakes that people can fall into when you try to translate from one language to the other. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. I hope you found this useful and um, I hope this helps you become a better translator and that's pretty much it for now. I'll talk to you in the next video. Okay, thanks. Bye.